Well, good morning, everyone, and you're very welcome to our webinar this morning on gender identity and particularly looking at the actions your business should be taking. I'm Christopher Singh. I'm a partner in the Free Employment Team. I'm a change to the published speaker today who is unfortunately unavailable. But I'll be speaking today with Nihar Lug, who is a knowledge management lawyer in our employment team. We're also delighted to welcome to join us Robin White, who is a barrister. Robin acted for the claimant in the recent landmark case of Taylor and Jaguar Land Rover. And since her own gender transition in 2011, Robin has advised extensively on transgender matters and has acted in a number of uh, cases for both employers and employees. Just before we kick off today, just some housekeeping. If you lose a connection for any reason, click on the original link in the invite that was sent to you. That should bring you straight back in. And there will be a Q&A session at the end of our webinar today. If you have any questions, there's a, a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. There should be a, a speech bubble there. Click on that, put your question in there. We'll either deal with it as we go through the seminar today, or we will get to it towards, uh, um, towards the end at the Q&A. If we don't get your question for whatever reason, we'll follow up with you afterwards. So just before we look at the agenda for today, I wanted to give it some context because we are in, in the middle of a fundamental shift in how society thinks about gender. 10 years ago, gender identity was, was rarely discussed. It's not a new concept, but now it's much more spoken about and it's, in, it's a mainstream discussion, often attracting significant media coverage. We've got transgender people on the cover of magazines, prominent celebrities challenging gender norms in fashion, We've got the mainstreaming of people who identify neither as men or women. And the last few decades of cultural trends have brought new ideas about gender to the forefront. Nowhere is this more apparent than the attitudes of millennials and Generation Z. These are more likely to identify as neither male or female, and they'll know someone, most likely, who uses gender neutral pronouns, and they're more likely to embrace fluid and non-conforming fashion. So, with all that in mind, let's look at what we're going to discuss today. So the, the first thing on the agenda is going to be Niha. She's going to go through current terminology. And after that, I'm going to look at the recent case of Jaguar Land Rover. And that case will sadly show us that despite progress in how society approaches gender, our workplaces are lagging behind. And the decision in that case is really important to those who identify within the trans or non-binary umbrella. I'll also look at some cases that address gender critical views and how those interact with the protection of a philosophical belief under the Equality Act. And we'll come on to what sort of actions you should be considering in your organisation taking, because employers and legislation will need to keep a pace of non-binary gender. So to kick off, I'll hand over to Niha. Thank you, Christopher. Um, so before we delve into the detail of the Jaguar Land Rover case, I wanted to look at some key terminology and appropriate language around gender identity. So we're aware that this is a developing area and for the majority of us, myself included, we're on a learning journey with this. So please bear with me if I'm talking through concepts and terminology that you're very comfortable with. I've taken the definitions from the gender Identification Research and Education Society and from Stonewall, a charity that campaigns for the equality of LGBT individuals and also the World Health Organization. So what do we mean when we talk about gender identity? Well, to understand what, what we mean, we need to clearly differentiate between sex and gender. So sex refers to the biological aspects of an individual determined by their anatomy and it's generally male or female and something that's assigned by, assigned at birth. Whereas gender is a social construction relating to behaviours and attitudes based on labels of max masculinity and femininity. So what is gender identity? Well, that is a person's innate sense of their own gender, whether it's male, female or something else entirely, which may not correspond to their sex assigned at birth. So an individual might see themselves as a man, a woman, as having no gender, as having a non-binary gender or some other sense of gender. And a person's gender identity often flows directly from the sex they were assigned at birth, but that's not always the case. So thank you, Christopher. On this slide, we've set out some commonly used terms when we discuss gender identity. 
So you may have heard the term cis or cisgender, and that's a term used to describe individuals whose biological sex or sex appearance aligns with their gender identity. And then we have the term trans or tra transgender, which is an umbrella term to describe people whose gender is not the same, or it doesn't sit comfortably with the sex they were assigned at birth. And then we've got the term non-binary. So this I think is a, an umbrella term that refers to people who feel their gender cannot be defined within the margins of a binary gender, so masculine or feminine. And non-binary individuals may then have specific genders within that. So, you know, gender fluid, moving between gender identities, agender, which is without gender, gender queer, or something else entirely. So those are some really key terms that we need to be aware of when we talk about gender identity. And lastly, intersex, which is a term used to describe a person who may have the biological attributes of both sexes or biological attributes that don't fit with societal assumptions about what constitutes male or female. And intersex people may identify as male, female, or non-binary. So if you have the next slide then, Christopher. We've got on this slide some important terminology around transitioning. Now it's important to remember that not all who identify as transgender will choose to go through a transition. And when we talk about transition, we mean the process of changing a person's sex or sex appearance to match their gender identity and this may or may not involve medical intervention. And transitioning may also involve such, such things as just telling family, telling friends, dressing differently, changing official documents. So it can be quite a broad term to understand. The term acquired or affirmed gender refers to the gender in which a trans person, transgender person lives and presents to the world. So that's not the gender that they were assigned at birth, but it is the gender in which they should be treated. And we also have an important um, sort of legal document, a gender recognition certificate. So this enables a trans person to be legally recognised in their required gender. A gender recognition certificate can be issued under the Gender Recognition Act, and it allows trans people to be legally recognised in their affirmed gender. So to get a gender recognition certificate, an individual needs to provide evidence of having permanently transitioned for the last two years into a new gender, even it, as well as any medical evidence that might be available. It's important to note that not all trans people will apply for a gender, re gender recognition certificate. So again, this isn't something an employer should always be asking for, but again, it can be something that is provided. And lastly, to, to, bring to, um, to bring to the forefront something called gender expression. Now, gender expression is how an individual presents themselves, perhaps through their choice of clothes or pronouns, and it may not correspond to someone's gender identity. So it's always important to, to say that gender expression is very different in, to gender identity. And a person whose gender expression doesn't conform with their birth sex may not always identify as a trans individual. So for example, cross-dressing. I hope that's been a useful walk through some of the key terminology in this area, but there is, there is a lot to get to grips with and there is lots of, that's, that's lots of useful resources out there. So please do let us know if you'd like any more support with this and we can provide um, you know, a, a guide to some key terminology for your business after the session. So with that in mind, I'd like to um, hand back over to Christopher to take you through the Taylor and Jaguar Land Rover case and the key implications for employers. Thank you. So let's have a look at this Land Rover case then. It's a complex case and I'll try to give you a flavour of it. Robin can, sorry, Rose can uh, correct me. Um, Robin can correct, correct me if I'm wrong about what I said about Rose Taylor, get the, get the names in the right order. So Rose Taylor began working at Jaguar Land Rover in 1998. Um, she was considered to be a high performer, she was a very competent engineer, and she had previously presented as male. In 2017, Ms Taylor began identifying as gender fluid, and in April 2017, Ms Taylor sent an email to her line manager 
in which she raised the fact that she was transgender. She made it clear that at that time, she had no plans for a surgical transition. And she also made it clear that HR were aware of her position. Ms. Taylor claimed that although her line manager said that he, he um, was giving his full support, he also made comments that she was not normal and that she should use the disabled toilets. Ms. Taylor began expressing her gender fluid identity at work and was subject to a number of comments in the workplace. And I'll give you a, a flavor of some of these. Um, I was checking out your dress, looked up, saw it was you and my jaw dropped, was a comment from a colleague. Another comment from a colleague, so what's going on? Are you going to have your bits chopped off? On the 31st of October, 2017, one of the respondents contractors commented on the claimant's outfit saying, is this for Halloween? And on the 17th of November, 2000, 2017, the claimant was stopped by a female engineer who said, it's nice to see you in your attire, you have cracking legs. So perhaps understandably, the claimant was upset by these comments. They were both offensive and unwanted. Ms. Taylor was being subject to, to regular harassment and nothing was being done about it by Jaguar Land Rover. Ms. Taylor raised his concerns of HR. She also expressed the anxiety she felt about how she dressed at work. And Ms. Taylor had communicated to some of her colleagues that she was trans, but she was concerned that they didn't really understand what this meant. Ms. Taylor was referred to occupational health for her mental health issues. She was suffering from anxiety, depression, and social isolation. And in a complaint that Ms. Taylor made to HR, she said, when is the company going to realize that LGBT people exist and they need support? It makes you feel worthless and undervalued and we are continually ignored. What can be done to fix this? So Ms. Taylor felt that the leaders didn't understand the effect of what they were saying. HR didn't know how to support staff and employees didn't feel able to speak up. On the 22nd of July, 2017, the claimant raised the fact that offensive comments were being made to her with HR and she was told by HR um, not to be sensitive in relation to the reaction of her colleagues and the issues she was facing when transitioning at work. And again, understandably, she found this response offensive and unsupportive because it implied that the claimant was wrong to complain, that the problem actually was her for being too sensitive. The claimant was having to contend with continuous tension that affected her mental health. And in April, 2018, she resigned. Her grievance had never resulted in a, a formal outcome and she felt there was a lack of willingness to learn and the support being offered was unacceptable. She later issued claims in the employment tribunal for harassment, direct discrimination and victimization on the grounds of her gender reassignment. So to refresh our memory on the law that comes from the Equality Act, a person has the protected characteristic of gender reassignment if they are proposing to undergo, are undergoing or have undergone a process or part of a process for the purpose of reassigning their sex by changing physiological or other attributes of sex. So in this case, Jaguar Land Rover argues that Ms. Taylor, um, as a gender fluid non-binary person, didn't fall within the definition of gender reassignment under the Equality Act. She was not pr um, proposing transition. She wasn't transitioning, nor had she transitioned. But the tribunal held that beyond any doubt that she was protected under the um, protected characteristic of gender reassignment because irrespective of how she described herself at any given time, she was on a journey of, of transition. And it was clear that this didn't require any sort of medical process. In reaching the decision, the tribunal judge commented that it was clear that gender was a spectrum and that gender reassignment concerns a personal journey and moving away, uh, moving a gender entity away from birth sex. Uh, Ms. Taylor was successful in her claims of direct discrimination harassment and victimization. And the implication of this judgment is that other complex gender identities such as uh, non-gender, agender, uh, gender queer, may also fall within the definition of gender reassignment under the Equality Act. The amount of compensation in this case was agreed at 180,000 pounds. It doesn't include Ms. Taylor's costs application, which I think is gonna be heard separately this month. Robin, I'm looking at you for a nod, is it? Yes, good, thumbs up, thank you. Um, the tribunal also made a um, statutory recommendation that Jaguar Land Rover's board of directors read the judgment in this case and that they should read the written reasons at a board meeting by March 2021. And following agreement between the parties, 
a number of other orders were made and uh, Jaguar Land Rover are required to, a, uh, to appoint a diversity and inclusion champion to commission an impartial investigation into diversity and inclusion across the business to annually report um, on progress in, in the diversity and inclusion field and for that report to be made available to employees, members of the public and Ms Taylor. And this is a case that's attracted significant media attention and Jaguar and Rover has since publicly apologised to Ms Taylor for the experience she endured during her employment. So in this case, it's clear, I think, that there were two separate issues. There was the, the wider issue of visibility and support for the LGBT plus community within the, the employer, but also the separate matter of how the claimant was supported in the workplace and uh, how a transition was supported. For example, how she was to dress, what toilet she was to use, and how the situation was monitored to provide health and support. The, the tribunal was heavily critical of HR in this case. And I, okay, so I'll just quote from the judgment in a couple of places. So they say, it's fair to say that the HR team has not functioned properly or provided accurate and professional advice in this case. They also said the advice from HR was woeful and they, the managers, cannot be blamed for relying on it. On your screen I've been, and in the slides, I've included a quote from the judgment. So I was having a slight IT issue. Sorry, bear me one second. Christopher, do you want me to read that quote out? Because um, I can see it on my screen. If you could, Neha, while you're doing that, I'll try and get my, my machine to work. Absolutely. So the as just to follow on from what Christopher was saying, the tribunal was really, really critical of, of the employer in this case. So the quote, I think, is quite powerful. And it says, the, this case came about as, oh, it's gone off my screen. I've got it I've got it up um but not on the screen that I think everyone can see but I will read it out so this case came about as a result of the culture of the organization the culture is not aligned to the respondents' policies, agreements, or statements of intent. And this is a lesson that has to be learnt at the highest level. It's a systematic failure and demonstrates that, res that the respondent values its employees' ability to perform their key roles far more than their personal welfare. Thank you for that. Thank, uh, my, my machine is working again, so uh, apologies for that. Uh, so so uh, as Nihal was saying, this is a damning indictment from the top down. Uh, and it's an important reminder that values and statements of intent need to be embodied in the actions of an organisation, not just in its written policies. And in this case, the, the tribunal were astounded that there was nothing in the way of proper support for Ms Taylor. And it, particularly, th there was no training nor enforcement on diversity and equality until the claimant raised the issue in 2017, bearing in mind how long the legislation had been enforced by this point. And it remarked, actually, it hadn't seen such a whole self failure in, in an organisation of this size in its entire collective experience. So I want to pick up on, on some of the key failures of the employer in this case and then have a chat with Robin if I may about um, some of her thoughts. So first of all, considering what the case was about, surprisingly uh, there was no equal opportunities policy in the hearing bundle. Uh, all of the respondents witnesses thought there must be one but none of them had seen it. Uh, all of them appear to be confused about um, the difference between the dignity, dignity at work policy, which dealt with um, bullying and harassment, and equality and diversity issues. And the sad truth is that have, having heard of the evidence that no steps were ever taken to implement the Equal Opportunities Policy or bring it to the attention of employees or managers in, in this case. None of the managers had received any particular training about the Equal, equal Opportunities Policy and employees as a basic must know that policies exist and that they should be followed. 
Another quote from the judgment in this case, this time on the issue of toilets. The tribunal said, firstly, telling a transition person, firstly, telling a transition, per sorry, I'll start again. Firstly, telling a transition person to use the disabled toilets is at the very least potentially offensive to them because it suggests that their protected characteristic equates to a disability. Secondly, disabled toilets are for disabled people to use and should not be used by other people. Also, by way of context, the claimant was eventually referred to occupational health because of stress, anxiety and distress. And she experienced this by reason of the workplace issues. I'm just going to flip back a slide just because my machine is not working again and it worked last time I did that. Oh, sorry, one second. Yes, it's working again. I'm very sorry about that. I hope it doesn't happen again. So, um, where are we? Yeah, so um, the, the claim was referred to patient health and because she had symptoms of mental uh, health issues, uh, because of how she's being treated. But what's important here is that whilst um, occupational health can, can help to manage the impact um, on someone's mental health of harassment, it doesn't change the underlying issue, which here was a sustained cause of wholly unacceptable treatment in the workplace. And the respondents' witnesses had accepted in evidence that the claimant had raised issue, these issues on numerous occasions, but no action was ever taken to, to prevent the harassment from occurring. And this was because in this case, the respondent took the view that the claimant had to name names or there's nothing they could do. So in other words, they viewed the harassment as a purely disciplinary matter where the victim must identify the perpetrator and if found guilty, that, that appropriate action would be taken. But that wasn't the only way the respondent could have dealt with the situation. And perhaps understandably, in this case, the claimant was reluctant to name names. She thought the situation might get worse, that if someone was disciplined because she'd um, made a complaint about harassment, that she may be treated badly by other employees as well. There are other ways of sending a clear message that such behaviour was unacceptable, wouldn't be tolerated in this workplace. And a more positive approach could have been to give a clear message to the entire workforce and to external contractors about what was acceptable in the Jaguar Land Rover workplace and the potential consequences of not adhering to that. As part of the grievance process, the claimant was asked by Jaguar Land Rover to explain what a successful outcome would look like. And she said, uh, and I'll avoid touching my screen because I keep breaking it, uh, success would look like visible support, interim steps and some action being taken. Just a word on the aggravated damages in this case, which is pretty unusual. The tribunal judgment said, this employment tribunal considers it appropriate to award aggravated damages in this case because of the egregious way the claimant was treated and because of the insensitive stance taken by the respondent in defending these proceedings. So by way of example, as part of the cross-examination, it was being put to Ms. Taylor that it was that bad, she could have left immediately. So as I said at the start of the webinar today, we do have Robin White with us, who was the barrister who acted for the claim in this case, and we're delighted to have her. Um, Robin, please forgive my very rough and ready summary of the case, and also my IT issues while I was doing it. But I do have a few questions for you about the case, if I may. Um, oh, very good, very good summary, Chris. Oh, thank you. Uh, so here we go. The first related to the, the criticism of the tribunal of Jaguar Land Rover. I think this, this is an example of the case of probably all the things you shouldn't do. So it's difficult to say what they could have done differently. But I think the tribunal did suggest some alternative things that the, the respondent could have done. Could you share some of these suggestions with us, please? Yes. Um, and let's focus on the name names point that you, you mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. Um, they, um, a point that came from the claimant's side was that they were... Um, the motor industry has lots of contractors involved, lots of other companies involved, and, and they, they buy bits in that will ultimately form part of the vehicle they're producing. So there's an awful lot of external contract work. And therefore, there's a risk of things like um, employees being bought expensive lunches and, and those sorts of things to influence what who gets the contract. And so JLR were very clear 
and you know for good reason very clear on their hospitality policy which had been very well um, briefed out to all staff and very clearly through the internal magazine and of course why could they not do something equivalent for diversity and the the tribunal judge came up with um, an, an example and she asked the managers about a health and safety issue if they, they realized because they're a big industrial plant so plainly health and safety is very important um, and if there was a health and safety issue that they needed to brief out to the staff um, there's, a, there's a process that a lot of engineering companies use called toolbox talks where the supervisor gets the work group together at the start of um, each shift uh, often to check who's just principally to check who's there but it's a great opportunity for um, messages to be given to the workplace uh, to the workforce and there's no reason why that couldn't have been used as a means of communication for the company's position on diversity and wasn't thanks robin that's really useful and i mentioned that um aggravated damages have been awarded in this case i mentioned one of the reasons but what other key reasons were there uh, why well, the, the yeah, there were two bits really. I, it was awarded on two bases. Um, now, unfortunately, in, in a sense, from from a legal perspective, we then agreed compensation. So it would have been fascinating to see what the tribunal would have actually awarded item by mm -hmm. item, because the hundred eighty thousand was a global figure, including these things. But they awarded it on two bases. They said that the um, treatment of the claimant in the workplace was so woeful that it needed to be reflected in aggravated damages, which, I mean, I, I've been in practice just over 25 years and I can think of only three cases in 25 years where I've been involved where aggravated damages have been awarded. So they're, they're really unusual. But the other basis was the, the way in which the case was defended in the, in the tribunal, tribunal, and you've mentioned one, which was to suggest, I mean, here was an individual who'd been sent off by her managers to occupational health when she'd been expressing uh, suicidal thoughts and to be cross-examined on the basis that she was exaggerating and, and um, you know she was hysterical which was put to her at one point uh, was astounding to me as, as counsel. Um, I, I act as often for employers as I do for, for claimants and it's often the case that counsel in a, in a discrimination case has to cross-examine a damaged claimant uh, you know rights and doesn't matter the rights and wrongs of the case the claimant perceives that they've been damaged by what's happened in the workplace and you and it's part of the skill set to cross-examine them appropriately the the tribunal um decided that the cross-examination was being done on instructions from jlr uh, and it was just nasty really and the other aspect was that there were more than 20 individual instances of discrimination jlr didn't challenge any of them that any of them had occurred didn't challenge the claimant's view as to how she she uh, how she felt in response to them but every time the claimant was asked well why did you do this that and the other and the claimant would say well that's because of item of discrimination x counsel would then say something like so you say in a dismissive way uh, in terms of um attempting to perhaps attempting to show that the claimant once again was exaggerating and after they'd done that two or three times, um, the, the judge stopped counsel for the other side and said, well, look, do you have a positive case about this? No. Uh, do you really think that's a useful line of questions? Uh, and humph. And, and they carried on with it. So um, shocking to me uh, to, to see a case run in that way, to be honest. Thank you. And one of the questions I had for you was that uh, Obviously, it's a damning judgment, as I say, but Czech Land Rover is a, is a massive employer and one of the biggest in the region. Do you think that the tribunal would have would have the same approach if it, was, if it was a smaller employer involved? I think, well, in this case, I think the failures were, uh, to, to echo your word, so egregious, so terrible. Uh, and in fact, not just related to gender reassignment, that there just was no effective diversity and inclusion structure in place for anything, sex, race, disability, you name it. Um, there were no support structures there. HR didn't seem to know what they were doing. So they, was, they were just so off the end of the scale um, that, that, frankly, any employer at any size, 30 years since discrimination legislation has come into play in, in the UK, um, 40 years, so can't 
can't be adopting this position. There is a range where when you run what's called the statutory defense. So if the employer, the employer can argue if there's a random act of an employee, um, if the employer has done all that's reasonably required to make plain that, for example, racist remarks are not acceptable in the workplace, and yet an employee makes a random racist remark, then the employer can run what's called the statutory defense and say, well, we did everything that was reasonably possible um, to prevent that happening. Now, it's certainly true that the jail are unbelievably tried to run the statutory defense when they'd done nothing. And, and the, the tribunal just, are, the, the tribunal were just, had their eyes out on stalks when we came to submissions and they said, they looked at the JLR submissions and said, and, and you're still trying to run the statute of defense? And JLR said, oh yeah, oh yes, so we are. But there is a range with that. So a small firm who won't have an HR department, who um, have a limited number of employees who won't come across these issues, uh, can reasonable for them means less than it does for a massive regionally um, significant employer like JLR with a big HR department and access to expensive lawyers and all the rest of it. So, um, but um, it, finding out whether the tribunal think your steps have been reasonable when you get to a tribunal is a bad time to find out when they're reasonable or not. It's Maybe. much better to, to make sure that you're well the right side of the line long in advance. Okay, thank you, absolutely, yes. And at least one of the comments made to Ms. Taylor was from a third party contractor. Are there anything that, um, is there anything an employer can do to try and protect its employees from third parties, you know, maybe service users or students or contractors? Yeah, I mean, and to take, you mentioned students, actually, I was thinking about that. We, um, I mean, plainly in Chambers, we have law students who come in and do mini pupillages with us. Mm -hmm. And um, we provide them with a three or four page document of expected behaviours for example, to those law students who come in and will sit in conferences. And I mean, plainly, we always ask clients if they're happy to have law students in with, it, with us. But we've made very plain to those law students what the expected behaviours are. Most businesses, if they're, if they're using a contractor, will have, some, will have a contractor contract. And undoubtedly, they will have some form of contractor behaviour in the contract. Uh, you know, you, even if it's just in terms of the performance of the work. So there is an opportunity to control um, and to make plain what the standards are uh, and to make plain that if they're not met, you know, there, there can be consequences flowing through the contract. Thanks, Robin. Um, thanks for your thoughts on that. I'm, I'm sure we'll have further questions for you later on as well, but I'm going to move on to some other cases at the moment which um, relate to gender. Everything still seems to be working, so great, I'll, I'll push on. So um, I think it's fair to say that in society there are different views on gender fluidity and um, thoughts are divided about it, especially when religious beliefs are involved. And as you may expect, there's a rise in, in the cases in the employment tribunal dealing with the issue of gender fluidity. And unhelpfully at the moment, there are no binding cases on the tribunal, but there are a number of useful uh, first instance decisions. So I'm going to talk about two of those today and bring um, these to your attention. And the first is the case of Forstatter. And in the case of Forstatter, uh, Mayor Forstatter provided consultancy services to CGD and her contract wasn't reviewed after she expressed her views about gender on, uh, on Twitter. And her views were critical. And in a series of tweets in 2018, she expressed her concerns regarding changes proposed for the Gender Recognition Act that would allow people to self-identify their gender. She also made numerous uh, other comments about um, the non-binary gender, uh, sorry, non-binary gender identity of a senior director at Credit Suisse. And she argued that her statements were manifest manifestations of her political belief, beliefs that they were protected. According to her view, a person's sex is a material reality which should not be conflated with gender or gender identity, and that being female was an immutable biological fact, not a feeling or an identity. And in reality, a trans woman is not a woman. She believed that while a person can identify as another sex, another sex and ask people to go along with it, uh, and you can change your legal sex under the Gender Recognition Act, this, this does not change their actual sex. 
Um, well, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Forstadt has said that her belief was important and she partly relied on the need to protect safe spaces and single sex services for women. And um, the tribunal had a different view about her views and I'll just read from what they said. They said, many of the concerns that the claimant has, such as ensuring protection of vulnerable women, do not in fact rest on holding a belief that biological sex is immutable. It is quite possible to accept that trans women are women, but still argue that there are certain circumstances in which it would be justified to exclude certain trans women from spaces that are generally only open to women assigned at birth, sorry, women assigned female at birth because of trauma suffered by users of the space who've been subject to sexual assault. Many of the illustrations the claimant relies upon do not in fact rely on the belief that men can never be women, um, but, on the but the analysis that there may be limited circumstances in which it is relevant that a person is a trans woman or trans man, such as ensuring appropriate medical care is provided, which takes proper account of trans status. There is nothing to stop the claimant campaigning against the proposed revision to the Gender, Rec to the Gender Recognition Act to be based more on self identification The claimant can legitimately put forward her arguments about the importance of some, some space but the importance of some safe spaces that are only available to women identified female at birth without insisting on calling trans women men. So the, trade, the tribunal found that uh, Ms. Forsutter was an absolutist in her view of sex and that it was a core component of her belief that she could refer to a person by the sex she considered appropriate, even if it could be considered um, that it would violate, violate their dignity or create an intimidating hostile degrading, humiliating, or offensive environment. So in its judgment, the tribunal found that the claimant genuinely held such beliefs, that these beliefs were substantial aspects of human life and behavior. And since that such beliefs had a, a scientific basis, they achieved a level of cogency and cohesion. So ultimately the tribunal found that the opinions did not qualify as a philosophical belief under the Equality Act, and they applied the Granger criteria from the Granger and Nicholson 2010 case. Specifically, they said that beliefs involved, um, that the beliefs in, try, sorry, try again. Specifically, they said that the beliefs involved misgendering, and they were therefore incompatible with human dignity and the fundamental rights of others. So, although this is a first instance case, and it's not binding on other tribunals, uh, and it is has been appealed to the Employment Appeals Tribunal, and Robin told me, I think it's gonna be heard in April this year, so another, another thumbs up from Robin, thank you. It is a good reminder that employers uh, should not discriminate against employees because they hold particular beliefs or religious views, but it doesn't give those employees carte blanche to express or manifest their beliefs regardless of the impact on others. And employers should be aware that whatever their personal beliefs, they should treat others with respect. So looking at um, the second case, this is, this is Higgs and Farmer's School, and it's another first instance case in the Employment Tribunal, but it took a different view uh, in its approach. So Mrs Higgs had views that are perhaps similar to the ones we just looked at. And Mrs Higgs is a Christian. She was employed as a pastoral administrator and work experience manager by Farmer's School. The school's head teacher received an anonymous complaint by email about the post Mrs Higgs was making on Facebook. And the complainant considered that the views expressed by Mrs Higgs could be interpreted as homophobic and prejudice against the LGBT community. And the post that Mrs Higgs had put on Facebook was reposting a piece written by someone else, but she'd added, please, re please read this. They are brainwashing our children. And there was a plea from her to sign a petition. The post related to the teaching in schools of same-sex relationships, same-sex marriage, and gender being a matter of choice. The school's head teacher replied to the complainant and asked for um, other examples of similarly offensive posts made by Mrs Higgs. And he was sent a further example of her reposting another article. And this article written by a third party referred to gender fluidity as a perverted vision. And that, that she said, the LGBT crowd with the assistance of the pro progressive school systems were destroying the minds of normal children by promoting men mental illness. But the claimant felt that Mrs Higgs had seemed to find um, an obnoxious category of people that would include several children in the school. Following an investigation and disciplinary hearing, Mrs Higgs was dismissed for gross misconduct. And she was 
uh, dismissed because she had breached the school's conduct policy in that uh, she had um, discriminated and indulged in a serious inappropriate use of social media. Her internal appeal was unsuccessful. She brought claims of direct discrimination and harassment on the basis that it was her philosophical beliefs that had resulted in her mistreatment. The Employment Tribunal, when considering her belief, said that a belief that sex and gender are set at birth is worthy of protection. And whilst it might upset some people, if freedom of speech and Articles 9 and 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights applied only to expressions of belief that would upset nobody, they would be worthless. But um, it went on to conclude that Mrs Higgs hadn't been dismissed for that belief. She had been dismissed um, because she discriminated uh, because of her inflammatory language used in her Facebook post, which could have led readers to believe that she was homophobic and transphobic. It considered the previous case I just spoke about of forced data, and it distinguished itself uh, in this case from that case, because the employee's belief in this case wouldn't be likely to result in discrimination against members of the trans community, it held that there was no reason to believe that the view expressed by Mrs Higgs would necessarily result in unlawful action by her, and there was no reason to believe that she would behave towards any person in a way such as deliberately and continuously upset them. Whereas Mrs. For Ms. Forstatter said that she would um, misgender somebody if she thought it was appropriate to do so. This case has also been appealed and we'll wait for uh, ultimately an EAT decision. So what do we do then about managing this clash in the workplace? And I've got some comments and then we'll look at um, some of the wider work that employers should be looking at. So it's worth bearing in mind that an employee can bring a claim of harassment directly against the employer because that employer is vicariously liable for the conduct of its employees in the workplace. But one of the ways, and Robbie mentioned earlier, that an employee an employer can defend itself against harassment claims is to show it took all reasonable steps to prevent an employee from carrying out such acts. And all reasonable steps is not defined in the Equality Act, but case law has helped establish that it means all reasonable steps and not just most reasonable steps and it's more about um, just to understand the legal framework that you need to make sure that you've demonstrated that um, you have equal opportunities policies anti-bullying anti-bullying policies in place that are working part of the way, the way of doing that is to educate so as employers we should be um, regularly revisit, revisiting these policies and proactively promoting them. There should be regular and specific training and updates to managers and employees. You need to ensure that employees understand what is meant by diversity, inclusion, discrimination, harassment, and anti-bullying by giving real world examples. We should be setting out to foster a culture of empowerment and promoting an inclusive culture where bullying and harassment are not tolerated. We should ensure that employees have a confidential way of reporting such behaviour and be reassured that they won't suffer any adverse consequences because they've called this kind of behaviour out. I think it's really important to engage with employees on this topic, irrespective of, of gender. And every case I've ever dealt with, it, it, it um, involves the word banter. So I think it's important to talk about the word, word, ban word banter with employees and to be clear about what is healthy banter and what oversteps the line into bullying or, or harassment. Another thing that we saw in the um, Jaguar and Land Rover case is the grievance wasn't concluded. And this, this also, unfortunately, is, is, a, is a common area I see, when, um, particularly when tribunal proceedings are started or employment has been terminated either by the employee or the employer. You need to make sure that you conclude grievances, uh, make sure they're properly investigated and are, are finalised. I think at this stage, now over to you. I think there's a series of polls now, Rebecca. Um, sorry, I was having a bit of a, a computer a computer lag. So thank you, Christopher. Yeah, I think the cases that Christopher has identified just shows the tension that there can be um, within the workplace, outside of the workplace. But before we move on to discuss some of the steps that businesses can take to support trans and non-binary individuals, we wanted to throw it out to you guys to have a think about where you consider your organisation to be in terms of its views on gender identity. So 
Um, rest assured that the responses to some of these the polls will be completely anonymous. Um, and I think Rebecca is just going to facilitate by popping one of the questions on screen, um, which I'm hoping you can you can see. So how often does your organisation mark or celebrate Pride Transgender Awareness Week, Trans Day of Visibility, International Non-Binary People's Day? So I think Rebecca's just going to give it a second while some of the responses start coming in. So I think those results are really, you know, are, are really interesting, but clearly that it's it's not, um, you know, it, it's it's quite common to to mark maybe pride, but maybe not some of the others. And so I think there's definitely some work to be to be done within organisations about bringing some of these awareness days and and really marking them to um, to everyone's attention. So the second question we've got is if you were approached by a non-binary employee or an employee wishing to transition at work. Would you be confident that you have the knowledge and tools to support them? So again, completely anonymous, um, but just to gauge some thoughts. I think we've got some responses there. So again, I think this is absolutely where a lot of businesses are. And I think that reflects um, reflects both what Christopher was saying in terms of societal change but I think a lot of it which we'll touch upon later is just giving you know managers and staff the tools to to foster an inclusive environment and the last question we have for you is that do you feel that a non-binary employee or an employee wishing, wishing to transition in your organization would be comfortable or confident approaching their manager or HR so again, just a yes or no. Thank you. I think that's really, really positive. I think there's what whilst there's still lots of work for organizations to do, I think there isn't there are a number of steps in the right direction. And hopefully as we move on from these polls, thank you, Rebecca, we can just um, highlight some of the other aspects or other steps that employers can take to promote visibility and support for trans individuals. So I wanted to divide this up into sort of two sections. So firstly, what businesses can be take the steps that businesses can be taking to foster a really genuinely inclusive culture, but also secondly, to move on to look at how businesses can support each individual trans or non-binary journey, recognising that each of those is different. So we all know that being an inclusive employer um, leads to better staff performance. And it's great to say that you're an inclusive employer, but to really deliver on that promise, you need a genuinely um, inclusive culture. And I think that was really highlighted in the um, judge's comments in the Jaguar Land Rover case. They were really stark. And I think it also made clear that it shouldn't be the job of an LGBT plus employee to, to train their rep HR representative or managers in equality and diversity, which Miss Taylor unfortunately ended up doing in, in some of the situations she was placed in. So Stonewall um, produced a report back in 2018. So it's, it's Stonewall's LGBT in Britain. And really worryingly, it found that one in eight trans employees have been physically attacked at work. And not unsurprisingly, it also found that half of trans people, sorry, just over half of trans people have either hidden or disguised the fact because they were afraid of discrimination in the workplace. So businesses need to ensure that their HR departments and managers are trained and prepared for any individual that might approach them to discuss their gender identity or any associated transition. So we've set out here some of the steps that your organisation can take and I'll just look at a couple of these in a bit more detail and, and just sort of check in with Robin as well in terms of her thoughts. But the first one on there, and I think Christopher highlighted it in his um, previous, with the previous case as well, was around education. So educating ourselves and those around us is one of the most powerful steps we can take to understand the trans experience and improve workplace culture making sure, as Christopher said, that staff are consistently trained on the changing face of equality 
to foster a more respectful and supportive working environment for people of all genders. So education would mean exploring potentially having bespoke training to the HR team and to management teams, or maybe a separate guide for managers um, to support non-binary employees who are, who are transitioning at work. And I don't know here, Robin, if you've got any thoughts or, or comments on the importance of education in the workplace and perhaps how you've seen other employers do this effectively. Yeah, I mean, plainly, it's got to be proportional to the size of the employer um, because trans is still the rarest protected characteristic. So there's, I mean, there's no real good way of, of tying the numbers down, but there's probably a trans employee somewhere in in somewhere between one in 500 and one in a thousand employees uh, which of course doesn't mean that a small employer is not going to face the issue because you know they could be the the employer on which the national lottery um hand points uh, in terms of a, 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 a trans or non-binary employee coming out to the employer but certainly at the larger sizes of employers um there are there's good training available. There are several companies that that will turn up at the workplace and and provide training directly uh, by a trans person. I mean, I'm I'm a very out trans person. I don't mind people you know knowing about it, discussing it. This is in fact talk 303 that I've done since I transitioned myself. So you know, I, I'm very firmly on the page that education is the thing that helps. And in 303 talks, I've never yet been asked a question I didn't feel that I wanted to answer. But not, or plainly not all trans people, exactly as you were saying with Rose Taylor, not all trans people want to be the champion in their workplace. Um, I would say the vast majority, like most employees, just want to get their head down and do their work and be valued for who they are. But there is, there's, there's lots of good information out here for people. Um, and, and if we're training to accept that people have different um, religious needs, uh, different needs from their ethnic background, different needs as between men and women, then there's no excuse really for not understanding what trans and non-binary people need from their employer. Absolutely. And I think to tie in with that, the recognition that having specific gender identity policies um, differentiated from sexuality or sexual orientation policies can is also really important. The research has shown that trans people face quite deep inequalities in the workplace, which differ significantly from those suffered by lesbian, gay and bi people. So having a policy that is very sp specific to that protected characteristic, but that emphasizes a very supportive and flexible, but, but tailored approach would be really important. So covering matters such as language, terminology, um, transitioning support in the workplace. So whether an individual be entitled to time off, whether it's paid, things like dress code, the all um, the, the often debated issue of, of toilets, which I know that we'll come on to talk about shortly, um, and any sort of changing shower facilities, um, changing employee personnel records. So there's lots that that policy can contain. Um, and also potentially what, um, when and what colleagues can be told about the transition or gender identity and only if that employee agrees. So it is really important to have a very you know, a specific policy in place uh, because the needs are very different to others in the LGBT, LGB community. Um, the other one that I wanted to flag on there is to role model LGBT inclusive behaviour and I'll, and I'll come on to talk about how other employers have done this in the workplace, but making a positive statement by marking some of those days that we highlighted in the polls. So International Non-Binary People's Day, a Trans Day of Visibility, and really having senior leaders committing to raising the profile on those days can, can you know, it, as, as the, the case in Jaguar Landro highlighted, it's about culture. And very often it's from the top down. And if you have senior leaders setting the tone, I think that can be really important. Um, and some organizations, organizations have also wanted to include pronouns on corporate email signatures. So for example, that's first name, your surname, and then the pronoun so that you wish to go by. So she, hers, as, as Christopher and I have done today, and, and Robin, I know you do on a, on a very regular basis. And a number of employers are taking this step. So it can be a gesture that really 
normalizes pronouns and shows that you understand gender to be non non-binary a non-binary construct and that you shouldn't make assumptions about um the you should make assumptions about traditional gendering based on you know perhaps a name and i think it's a really positive signal to colleagues and to customers that yours is an in inclusive organization i think we may have lost christopher um but i think hopefully he'll be joining us shortly um so i know the slides have gone off but one of the um step that employers can take in this area is looking at the employee life cycle so considering the trans experience at all stages of the employee life cycle so for example recruitment you know fear about attending a job interview in the potential way they want to want to dress pay terms and conditions of employment promotion pathways training dismissal redundancy and job references so there's lots of areas where employers can be considering the trans journey and trying to make sure that they accommodate the trans journey at, at, at all those various stages of the life cycle. Um, one of the questions that we've had in advance of the seminar today was around collection of um, data on gender um, and, and looking at you know, forms that employees or customers have to fill in, for example, at recruitment, um, and whether there's the option for people not to include a title or the increasingly more common non-binary title, which is MX. Um, I think there, are, there was other questions around the sort of legal issues or some tricky issues. And I wondered, Robin, if you had some thoughts you wanted to share around the tricky issues um, for data collection for employers. Well, I think uh, the, the best advice usually is be, be very, start from the position, do, do we really need to collect this data? Because that, um, if you've not got it, then you can't store it inappropriately and you can't run into GDPR issues. Yeah. So, but there will be times when you do need to collect data. And therefore, you know, the fact that a particular individual wants to identify with a particular title, um, what's the problem with that? I mean, an employer plainly will have obligations like ensuring the immigration status, for example, of employees. So, uh, there is a need on occasion for employers to collect uh, very, very core personal data. But for example, why is a passport not good enough? Uh, there, there are still employers out there who insist on seeing birth certificates. Um, amazingly, I, I was asked to advise on uh, that only last week. Um, but why, for example, is a passport not good enough? If you are insisting on particular identifiers, ask yourself why you are doing that and what really is the purpose. Yeah, thank you, Robin. I think that also would tie in with the sort of GDPR approach as well of collating data, which is necessary and proportionate. So again, analysing what you're collecting, when you're collecting it and how long you're collecting it for. Um, so I appreciate you can't see some of the slides, but we're just going to move on now to talk about how um, employers can look to create a, a truly inclusive culture at work, but also really support each individual trans or non-binary experience in the workplace. So I think it, the sort of starting point for me, and, and it's really important to remember here, that the first conversation you have with a non-binary or transitioning individual about this subject will, will have required a great deal of trust and courage on their part. So the conversation that you have or that your managers are having will set the tone for the workplace transition. And it's really, it's really got to be encouraging and positive. So where the employee has confided in you about this, it's really important to take the time to understand as much as possible about the employee situation. Um, I think to listen and be flexible and to agree a flexible plan with them would be a really key step that employers could take. Um, Recognising that each trans person would have a different experience and so address that situation individually and Understand that there can be a lot of confusion from misunderstanding about terminology or misuse of term of terms, and that can lead to reduced confidence in management or or their organisation. So, think ahead of of that meeting um, and how you can manage that initial meeting and the steps that you might take to convey your support um, and that of the organisation. And again, at this stage, I just if if Robin, you wouldn't mind me asking you another question. Um, mm -hmm. Really, just what the what the most 
helpful or most important thing that your chambers did and how they supported you during during your transition? Yeah, well, that's uh, I think answer, and I'm you know I'm pleased to pay tribute to my um, my chambers who really helped me through my transition ten years ago. It'll be later this year, uh, and I think the most important thing for me was to be involved in every discussion about and it was a new thing for chambers um my minor claim to flame is that i'm the first person to have transitioned in practice at the discrimination bar and so it was something that was completely new for chambers to deal with and it, it wasn't something that the head of chambers and the, the the senior clerk headed off into a little room on their own and decided how to deal with you know, I was part of all those discussions about how we were to announce things, who was to know when, how it, how it was to be done. You know, it didn't take up vast amounts of time, but I therefore felt I, I knew what was going to happen at every stage. I felt completely supported. And, and why should not that be so for every trans employee? Absolutely. I think, as you said, you know, listening, asking questions is one of the most important steps that an employer can take um, and, and again to involve the trans individual with the discussion that is plainly about about them their journey their workplace can, couldn't be more um, couldn't be a more important step and I think there's there is the need also for employers to consider adaptations to maybe help people who are transitioning in the workplace so potentially around if there's any medical intervention or medical treatment so time off whether it's paid there's lots to um, lots an employer can do to to support and I think we um, are going to move on and appreciate Christopher's now back so I think we can pop onto the slides oh, on. that's quite all right about what um, employers can do to support the individual trans journey and we were going to touch on any practical or logistical sort of barriers and really helping trans individuals overcome that and I think we've had this question from quite a few of our delegates today around things like toilets and changing facilities and I think the answer has to to be has to be that non-binary people should be supported to use the facility that best matches their gender identity or the or the, the space that they feel the safest in and again I, I would just ask Robin if she's got any thoughts or comments on, on that and I, I know this seems to be a common question no, but no no you're absolutely I mean the principle is absolutely right but, but what I think it's important to remember is that the transitioning employee needs to be part of, um, you know, is part of a workforce, is part of a work group. And therefore, one of the problems in, in Taylor and Jaguar Land Rover is that nothing was done with the rest of the work group. And Ms. Taylor was left to bear the burden of, you know, if, if someone challenged her in on one set of toilets or the other, um, she was the person who was left to defend what was happening. Now, it, it, it comes up all the time. I, I wholly understand that particularly in male orientated workplaces, female toilets can be a female, can be seen as a female safe space in the workplace. And, but if I'm in the ladies in Sainsbury's, I'm there to pee. I'm, I'm not there for any other purpose. And, my, you know, inappropriate behavior in a private space, be it the toilets, be it the stationary cupboard, to, you know, to take an old stereotypical example, is inappropriate behavior. And it should be dealt with as such. And I've helped employers have that discussion with uh, um, the rest of the workforce effectively on occasion. And of course, it's a much more controlled situation than public lavatories or whatever. If someone's transitioning at work, you know who it is, you know who's transitioning, you know why they're transitioning. And, and actually a, a bit of open discussion in pretty much every circumstance has had those fears fall away because people are not, toilets are one issue to, because people are generally not naked in um, a, a set of workplace toilets. It is slightly different when you get workplaces where there's a need to change um, so where there is a need to change or shower or whatever. And in exactly the same way that individual employees may not want to be um, in a communal circumstance in, in, in that circumstance, even, even within their own sex group, 
there are plenty of people who would not want to be naked collectively with their work colleagues uh, in those relatively rare work circumstances where that applies then presumably employers will want to have arrangements that that respect dignity and place for everyone um, and and that would include trans people or people who would find it difficult to be naked with a trans person present and I think we discussed, as you say, about the wider workforce, communicating for an employer to make it clear that all staff, um, once living and working in an identity, can, can potentially choose the facilities that, that best match their identity, but that if an, any other individual or an employee in the workforce has a concern or an issue, that they have a safe space to, to raise that. So again, like you say, a lot of this is about education and communication, and once you have that, it can break down a lot of the fears and the prejudice that, that may exist. Um, I'm just conscious of time and the number of questions coming through. So what I wanted to do was just pick up on um, just one of um, the examples of what other employers are doing in this area. And I think Newcastle City Council is, is a really good one just to flag a couple of the points that they're doing to, to really um, foster an inclusive and diverse culture. So they became a Stonewall Top 100 employer in 2005 and they've been the highest ranking local authority for three years in a row now and, St and Stonewall considers that the council actually leads the way for support of trans staff service users and communities and what they do is they work closely with local trans organizations to raise awareness of trans experiences and in 2019 the council worked with the NHS and other regional stakeholders on a conference which improved understanding and the needs of trans people and particularly the needs of trans local in the local community. They also have an active LGBT staff network and they run actually a very positive reverse mentoring scheme for senior leaders to help senior leaders better understand the lived experience of LGBT staff. And the network also provides confidential support to LGBT staff and offers constructive feedback on LGBT issues of inclusion. So there's just a few more examples on the slide of what other employers are doing. Um, they're available on, on Stonewall. And just before I flip to um, Christopher for the questions, we've also popped on the slides, which we'll send a copy of um, after the session, some useful resources for employers, along with our contact details, if you've got any comments or thoughts or questions. And so with that in mind, I will just um, hand over to Christopher to see, to, to check in with the questions that have popped up on the session. But thanks, Nia. And apologies to everyone again for the IT issues I've been experiencing. I think it's homeschooling and my daughter playing Roblox downstairs and taking all the bandwidth. I'm now currently operating off my phone network, so apologies for that. And by reason of that, I can no longer see any of the questions that have been asked. I've, I've lost all of those, Nia. So you are you able to access them on your screen? Yes, I do. Of course, I do. Yeah. Um... So I think this was in relation to the Jaguar Land Rover case. To whom will the diversity and champion report to? And if the case is a bit to be taken really seriously, the diversity and inclusion champion needs to really be reporting to the board rather than someone in HR, for example. I think, Robin, do you want to offer your thoughts on this one? Yeah. Well, actually, it's a clarification rather than a thought. Um, the champion is to be a member of the Jaguar Land Rover board. Absolutely. Right. So um, I think um, uh, I think it, that appeared in the remedy that the notes appeared in the remedy judgment and we had it corrected. Um, uh, and in fact, in the longer judgment it, on page, page 60, it says the respondents board agrees to appoint one of its number as a diversity and inclusion champion. So it was actually the, the question is absolutely right about this having to be led from the top. And so, in fact, the point was that the champion is to be a board member. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, I think without having the, the tone from the top, it's hard to embed that true culture, um, inclusive culture. And we have a question around recommend. What do you recommend for employee training and guidance? Even today, race discussions are tiptoed around and it's still not always clear to people what you can or cannot say. While some comments are clearly inappropriate this is a really new area for many people and how do we do the best we can to protect everyone and ensure we're educating our teams appropriately? I think this is a this is a really excellent question faced by 
so many employers and I think we we touched on it earlier with with education and the consistent education around how the you know the, the societal perception of gender is changing um, I think it's really true to say that people are there is a sense of fear because they're worried about saying the wrong thing and and I would um, probably echo something that Robin said to me is if you you know if you don't know ask and it's it's something that is as simple as that that I think can really break down the barrier to say that I am I'm asking you a question I'm interested rather than making an assumption and I don't know Robin if you've got any thoughts or suggestions around. Uh, that's absolutely right and it's the same I mean we're, we're now working through trends in the way that we work through sexual orientation in the workplace a few years ago for example and the, the sensitivity about having a social event and inviting employee and partner you know, as opposed to employee and wife or husband for example which um, allowed that degree of inclusion it, it's silly I actually write um, I write some of the problems that are used to test people who want to be new employment judges <laughs> and we always include a difficult to pronounce name in, in, in any of those um, uh, uh, test problems that I write and of course the right the right thing for the judge to do is to say to somebody I'm sorry how do you pronounce your name or would you pronounce your name for me um, in in a perfectly neutral straightforward way and you know that's the approach is to say right I don't you are bringing to the workplace an experience which I I don't have um, you know we value you as an employee we want to understand and uh, larger employers can spend money on seeking out professional training smaller employers can I think you have you do have to be a bit careful that you're you're drawing in advice from appropriate organizations because there are some organizations with rather unpleasant views but I think it's pretty easy to work out who they are and plainly everybody on the call today is a step forward because they've got well you've got um, an association with free so you've got you know an immediate source of, of, of a route to information through um, a, a decent firm of solicitors. Thank you, Robin. I didn't, we didn't, oh, thank you, Robin. Um, I'm conscious of, of time and that we have got a, a couple of questions that have come in, but we will probably have to answer them um, by email or, or sort of follow up with you guys. But just what I, I just wanted to really thank everyone for their time, um, taking the time out of your day to attend, and also to Christopher and to Robin for, for sharing your thoughts and comments, because I think this is, a, as we said earlier at the start, this is a learning journey for, for, for all of us, um, and we're all kind of finding our feet. And we will circulate the slides after the, after the session. Um, they've got some really useful resources, and, and as you know, we're always here um, to support you through this. So I'd just like to thank you all again for your, for your time and look forward to hearing from you. And can I just echo that? And also, um, I'm not sure it's been mentioned while I've been cut off, but certainly one of the things I'll be looking out for is uh, Robin's book that's coming out uh, next month, I think, which is a, a practical guide to transcend the law. I think the practical guide is really the key point here. So um, thank you for, again for everyone attending and apologies for my IT issues. <laughs>